Well, it's that time of the year again when the financial and corporate elite, along with their governmental lackeys, come together in the quaint Swiss resort town of Davos to discuss how they're going to divvy up the wealth of the world and address all the problems that they all caused but will never admit to having caused. You know, since the financial crisis of 2008, the theme of Davos has mostly been about sacrifice, not for these guys, of course, but for you and me and everyone else who's not in their elite little club. And austerity is mainly what's been on the menu at Davos, and it's been served up in healthy doses all over the place at the suggestion of these geniuses who, I repeat, nearly brought the global economy to its knees and caused millions upon millions to lose their jobs and homes in what is not just an economic disaster, but a humanitarian disaster that rivals the fallout from any world war. The austerity that they've been telling us will work wonders has failed year in and year out to bring about the predicted results. And even as more and more people hit the unemployment rolls, the cry becomes more of the same, only in bigger doses. And some of the members of this elite club, like the IMF, even unapologetically admit that their remedies are not working. But then in the very next breath, they'll tell us we need to do more of it. It's kind of like the woodcutter who says, no matter how much I cut, it's still too short. And then he keeps right on cutting. And for us peasants, if we dare even think about getting out of line and rising up in demonstration, we are met with ready armies of militarized law enforcement and police who have been bought and paid for by these very criminals and trained to ignore and trample over basic legal and constitutional rights. And the cops, well... They're coddled just enough and they're dumb enough. That's right. It's all done through select recruitment that purposely sets the intelligence bar not too high. Um, well, they're blind enough and they follow robotically the orders of their masters. And speaking of these masters, many of them have been educated in the world's most elite institutions, which themselves have been poisoned by this dogma. Places like Harvard and Yale or the London School of Economics or the University of Chicago, all bastions of neoliberal thought. Which brings to mind a certain fellow by the name of Ken Rogoff, the Harvard economics professor who's been in the news a lot lately. Now, some of you might know Rogoff. He was the co-author of a book with fellow economist Carmen Reinhart entitled, It's Different This Time. Catchy title, huh? The book purportedly looks at 800 years of debt crises and it's received accolades from all the usual places, meaning that it has garnered the praise of the elite of academia, as well as the clueless mainstream media who hold the book up as some deep revelation of economic truth. Now, I admit that I haven't read the book. However, I have skimmed through its table of contents, and I know people who have read it. And all I see there are the usual suspects like Zimbabwe and Argentina and Bolivia and Turkey and Brazil, and all the prior and current basket cases of nations that got themselves into trouble borrowing in some other currency or where they had a vast portion of their productive capacity wiped out due to war or corruption or something of that nature. Now, the book I'd prefer to see written by Reinhoff and Rogoff is the book on debt crises that came about in modern, highly productive nations that issued their own free-floating, non-convertible currency. Now, that book you're never going to see because there simply are no examples of that, past or present. Rogoff has to rely on trickery and ruse, passing all these basket case examples off as bulletproof support for his arguments, even though none of them are applicable. Every example in Rogoff's book involves countries that had or have currency regimes tied to some, uh, some convertibility, like a gold standard, fixed exchange rates, etc., or where the debts were denominated in somebody else's currency, where, as I said, or, or as I said, where the productive capacity of the country had somehow been impaired due to war or corruption or something along those lines. There has not now or ever been a country that had large productive capacity and where its currency was non-convertible and floated freely that had any problem of insolvency or where it experienced a debt crisis or currency debasement, whatever that means, or hyperinflation. None. Absolutely zero. It simply cannot happen. And I dare anyone to give me just one example. 
Rogoff is an arrogant jerk, but because he's uh, from Harvard, I guess, you know, that, that institution that brought you Robert Rubin and Larry Summers, he's there in all his glory in Davos, everyone huddling around him like a bunch of groupies, and he's there with the rest of his criminal friends and conspirators because, hey, that's what they are. Let's call a spade a spade, my friends, because it's their work, the fake work of guys like Rogoff that's used again and again as the basis for financial sector fraud, theft, and criminality, and the pushing of fake remedies like austerity that we see as total failures, yet it goes on and on and on, and we hear Rogoff, the criminal accomplice, say things like stimulus would be misguided and a disaster, and austerity has to be adhered to, even as millions, no, make that billions, suffer, and the results go farther and farther in the opposite direction of what they had promised. Meanwhile, this is all by design. It's designed to strip the wealth from the public, wealth that has been paid for over and over again by taxes borne hardest by the least fortunate, and all that stripped wealth gets funneled right up to the top to those cronies so that they can buy more of the political machine that keeps them above the law and in control. And it's too late now, folks, because even the mere thought of uprising is not tolerated because any attempt to broadly disseminate the message or attempt to assemble is labeled subversion or branded as terrorism, as what was the case with Occupy Wall Street, and then it gets crushed. So if I sound resigned, well, it's because I am. We cannot win collectively. Unfortunately, it's too late for that. We can, however, get small individual victories. If we're smart enough and savvy enough to know how to bet, how to bet against these thieves and idiots, that's the only way you personally have a chance. Money can still save you in this environment, and you can make it if you're savvy and know how to use the, the failed policy, the policies of these guys to your benefit. You bet right, you should be well rewarded. And some of us, like myself, are here to help you. Anyway, that's it for now. This is Mike Norman saying we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.